Now, what I'm going to uh, do is start by looking at something which Mizi said. And what I'll be doing in the course of my talk is simply expanding and explaining how he reached uh, that conclusion. Okay. Um, right. Here we are. Can I put this, put this up, please? What do I do? Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. What Mizi said was that there is nothing, uh, sorry, the market economy does not respect political frontiers. Its field is the world. In other words, so far as the uh, each individual economy is concerned, what we're looking at really is a sector of the world economy. The question is how this happened. The second point, which quote which you've got up there, is of course uh, a very old quote. And there is no new thing under the sun. Uh, in other words, international trade, a long distance trade, is something which began back in the Stone Age when we first emerged as uh, human beings. So it's something which has been going on for a long time. Uh, and there's really no need to be afraid, uh, afraid of it. <laughs> okay. Now, what I did, I was, uh, this was actually at the beginning of a lecture which I prepared for my students in, in Australia, what I did was I simply went at random through the house and I had a look at the various products and where they came from. And now this is in Australia, not here of course, but as you'll see as we go through, just about every little item there was made somewhere outside of Australia. Okay, byros, what you people call ballpoint pens, we people properly called Byros. <laughs> it was invented by Joseph Byros, so we always remember him. Okay, they're made in Germany and Japan. And your towels and sheets are made uh, in India and in Australia. And uh, I'm staying with Norma, uh, who's on the staff here, and she doesn't know, but I had a quick look through her linen closet. And <laughs> and found that your sheets here are actually made in China, not <laughs> as in... Uh, okay, um, now I had, uh, you know, the medicines are made in Denmark, England, France and Germany, uh, toothpaste. I don't know, what, uh, well your toothpaste is obviously made in the US, but mine is made in Ireland and in Australia. Uh, my computer is made in Malaysia, the various accessories, you know, things which you plug into it. Don't ask me what they are. Um, are made in Taiwan and Thailand. Uh, the TV is made in Malaysia, but it's made by Philips, which is a Dutch multinational enterprise. Uh, the CD player is made in China, but that is by a Japanese uh, company, multinational. The nail clipper, for some reason, is made in the US. I don't know why. <laughs> That's your specialism. <laughs> It's only nail clippers, however, scissors and things are actually made in China. That is what I found. Uh, light bulbs are now made in Indonesia. They don't last as long as the Philips light bulbs, which are made uh, somewhere in Malaysia, but they're cheaper. Uh, clocks and watches is interesting. For uh, over 30 years now or more, it's the Japanese who've been making the clock movements, and therefore you've made these very cheap throwaway watches. Uh, and the cases, of course, are made in China and the Philippines. Mugs are made in, well, my mugs anyway, are made in Korea, Japan, England, and Sweden. Uh, Norma's mugs are made in Korea and Taiwan. <laughs> um, the soap was made in Germany and Australia. And the books, now this is interesting, which has happened very much in recent years, where you've had more, you might say, free trade. And the books we find are printed in mostly the US and Britain, 
but many are also printed in Spain, Slovenia, Italy, and Singapore. And those are the more complicated uh, multicolored books, illustrated books. And many are also typeset in South India, where labor is cheaper, but then printed elsewhere. And I'll come back to this uh, printing thing later on when I'm talking about uh, U.S. Uh, history. Okay. Uh, perfumes are made in England, Australia, China. The talcum powder, for some reason, was made in China. Now we find another interesting range of things. Clothing, toys, a spanner. I think that's what you people call a monkey wrench or something. Anyway, we call it a spanner. Uh, screwdrivers, clips, shoes, etc., all made in China. The bookcases, originally made in Sweden, the ones which I bought earlier, and the later ones are made in China and also now Vietnam. It's now starting to produce furniture. At least we're getting it in Australia. Uh, stools are made in Finland, pots and pans, Korea, writing pads, Indonesia. And then when you look at the electronics, the higher uh, big ticket items, as you say, the reverse cycle air conditioner was made in Japan. The dishwasher was made in Italy, at least until it clapped out and I had to get a new one. Uh, the fridge is from Italy. The washing machine, very good, it's lasted for years and years and years, it's made in Japan, and uh, the car is from Sweden, and that's because uh, my husband is very keen on uh, safety, otherwise most of our cars are made in Japan and now in Korea. All right, okay, how is Australia surviving with all these imports? <laughs> I can assure you, <laughs> we are all alive and well and happy and flourishing. Okay, now let's have a look at uh, some of these items. Now, I'll, I'll give you the answer straight away. What's happening is that for each of the countries that you're looking at, for each of the products that you're looking at, the firms involved are producing literally for a world market. Uh, soap, for example, is now made, uh, is a complicated chemical product. It's not as simple as it looks. And that is why you find the Germans are uh, uh, world suppliers of soap. Because they have, since the late 19th century, they've specialized in the production of chemicals. Again, they're the world suppliers of things like fertilizers, pesticides, all sorts of chemicals everywhere. Even from the late 19th century onwards, in the U.S., you find that it was the German firms which were really the main suppliers of chemicals. All right, I'll add another little story here about what governments cannot do. First World War, all the German assets in the U.S. were confiscated and handed over to American companies. 1918 onwards, guess what happened? The Germans returned to produce exactly the same things as they'd produced before 1914, the chemicals and so forth. And although the American companies had all the assets, they just could not compete. Mm -hmm. Second World War, the same thing happened again. All the German assets in the U.S. were confiscated, handed over to American companies. Post-1945, what happened? The Germans returned. And again, the American companies could not compete. The reason, of course, is because when you've been specializing in something for 125 years or more and supplying it to the world, um, you know, you become specialists. And that is exactly what's been happening here. If you have a look, as I mentioned, as I, to repeat, Japan, for example, now supplies cars to the entire world. Now, if you can think of producing, X, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of cars that is, and you think about the costs involved, reduction in costs when you're producing on that scale, uh, obviously uh, the world is going to get huge numbers of cars, all produced very cheaply, and more importantly, what you're going to get is a much wider range of cars. In other words, more specialized for the different kinds of tastes, requirements that people have in different parts of the world. Uh, similarly, with things like washing machines and computers and all these things, you get a range produced, uh, rock bottom costs, because you're producing for the world. Uh, and therefore, again, a range of, co of, co of uh, types available, 
and of course much better quality. It keeps on improving year after year, uh, these products. Okay, so that's what, and you see here, the other point I want to make is that you get countries joining the world economy, as it were, becoming additional regions in the world economy, Vietnam now, now producing small uh, items of furniture. All right, another point I want to add is that China, the big bogeyman, is not a very large player in the world as a whole. You see all these other countries also part of uh, the world economy, and again, as I said, producing for uh, the world as a whole. Uh, China supplies uh, only 21% of Chinese exports come to the U.S. Uh, what is it, 89% or whatever, 79% go to the rest of the world. And why does the U.S. get such cheap goods from China? Because China produces for the world as a whole. It's selling clothing to the world as a whole. Again, think in terms of reduction in costs, increase in range and variety, and therefore the U.S. also benefits. All right, okay. Um, now, to reinforce this, to show what it is in reality, I thought we might have a look also at the cotton clothing. Uh, there's a jacket hanging up in Norma's laundry, and I peered into it. it was <laughs> made in Hong Kong, it said. Okay, so what does made in China mean? I'll tell you the answer in advance. It means made by the entire world. Even the U.S. is involved. Okay. Right. Cotton clothing. Label says made in China. That's what the government requires. Made in China. All right. Well, you start with the clothing that's in your cupboard at home here in the U.S. And we then move on. Is that the only copy I have of that? Sorry, I haven't got my own copy. Okay, all right. The clothing in the cupboard here in the, uh, in the U.S. All right, next step. You still have American investment, American equipment, whatever required to produce it and put it in your cupboard at home. So you've got the people who are involved in the import the retail shops, your wholesalers, etc., etc. The container ships which bring the goods from China to the U.S., they don't fly from the factory to your cupboard. Okay, those container ships are registered in Panama, uh, Liberia, Greece, Norway. In Greece and Norway, again, world suppliers are shipping services. Therefore, much cheaper than anyone else, certainly much cheaper than either the Australian or the U.S. Uh, shipping services, God bless us. Okay, and the ships themselves are now made in Korea and Japan. The containers, I just looked it up, are made in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, the labor on the ships comes from the less developed countries, the Philippines, various other less developed countries. Okay, if you go to the docks in China, the, the uh, clothing has to be taken to the docks. The lorries or the trucks are all made in Japan. Uh, the clothing factories are in China, the cloth is made in China, but where do the industrial sewing machines come from? Japan, Korea, and also the US. Okay, the cloth has to be dyed and finished, the dyeing works are in China, but where do the chemicals, the dyes and all come from? They come from Germany. You need buttons, where do the buttons come from? Again, the factories are in China, but the machinery to make the buttons is made in the U.S. and Taiwan, Hong Kong, and so forth. Japan is the world supplier of zippers. It's impossible to buy a non-Japanese zipper. So therefore, you have best quality zippers, uh, you know, produced at the least possible cost because, it's, again, supplying gazillions to the world as a whole. Okay. Um, Right, now the cloth is woven and spun in China. Again, where does the machinery come from? It comes from Britain. Okay, the transport and the shipping of the machinery to China. Again, your shipping industry is involved. Uh, you have then the cotton dealers who supply the raw cotton to the factories. 
And the fact with the farms producing the raw cotton are uh, Uzbekistan these days, China, Egypt, which produces the world's best cotton and has produced the world's best cotton since uh, the late 19th century, still continues to do so, and the U.S. All right, your government again. U.S. cotton is produced at, I don't know, five, six, seven times the world price. So it's your subsidized cotton, which is going to the Chinese factories to produce the cotton clothing, which now comes back to the U.S. Uh, again, another little story. Um, earlier, in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, first of all, you had subsidized production of cotton in the U.S., and therefore producing it, again, five or six times the world price. Then you had to sell it, so you had an export subsidy to sell it at the world price. Hong Kong factories bought U.S. cotton at the world price, and then, of course, sold the cotton, uh, the clothing here in the U.S. So then your Department of Commerce, bless its heart, added a countervailing tariff to offset the fact that it was buying U.S. cotton at world prices. So you have, first of all, a subsidy, and then another sub a production subsidy, and then an export subsidy, and then you have a countervailing tariff. So, you know, you <laughs> where do you stop? Okay, so, uh, the, but the cotton gins, you need cotton gins to produce the cotton, they're made in the U.S., uh, world specialists again. Um, now, all these farmers use, again, fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, they all come from Germany. And again, you have to use world shipping to get uh, all these inputs to the farmers in Uzbekistan and so forth. The steel for the machinery and for the ships and the containers and so on which are produced are all made in Japan and Korea. And finally, that's where Australia comes in. We supply the world with commodities. Uh, we supply the world with foodstuffs, uh, meat, grain, etc. And at prices, again, about one-half to one-third U.S. prices. Uh, once, uh, I spoke to my husband back in Australia about the price which I saw meat at in the supermarket here. He was horrified. He went around immediately to the supermarket at home and had a look, and we find that the prices are about a half, and the quality is much better. Uh, so again, it's your government which is getting in the way and preventing living costs from falling. Uh, Again, a uh, very ordinary example. Before we reduced tariffs in Australia, if I wanted to buy a jersey for Dennis, I paid 60 or $70. Now that the tariffs have been removed and we're importing goods from China, I pay, uh, guess what, $10 for a jersey. Good quality jersey. And in the, now I've got, what, 50, 60, whatever dollars left over to buy other things with. Okay, um, so... When you read a label which says made in China, it is not made in China. It is made by the world economy, by the globe as a whole. Uh, nothing, it is impossible to make anything, you might say, uh, in one country. And that is why, as Mises pointed out, the, world, the market economy does not respect political frontiers. Its field is the world. And starting with the Stone Age and now year 2006, what we have is a world economy. Okay, now, um, as I, we've already noticed that we've got uh, specialisms appearing, and the specialisms which have lasted well over a century, and therefore we get the, everyone gets the benefits of uh, specialized knowledge, uh, uh, improving techniques, building up of knowledge in particular areas. Okay, now you say, how are we going to compete with uh, all these other countries? The answer is, of course, you compete in producing goods that were not produced before. Uh, the, uh, in, the resources which went into high-cost, co high low-quality cotton fabrics in Australia now go into the production of other things, processed foodstuffs, for example which we sell in Asia. And we can sell it in Asia because Asian housewives believe that there is no pollution in Australia, the food is very good quality, it is pure food, and therefore they're quite happy to buy 
uh, you know, biscuits and things made in Australia. The other thing is, you notice that on, that on the list there, I do have some Australian sheets. Now, what is the difference between Australian and Indian uh, household linen? The difference is in quality. So that the Australian mills now specialize in producing very high quality uh, clothing, fabrics, whatever. And the ordinary, everyday things you buy uh, from China or India or wherever, whoever supplies it. And the same thing, the Swiss weren't able to do anything at all about the Japanese and other competitors. And so now instead of producing cheap watches, what they produce are very high quality, very expensive uh, watches that do all sorts of things, you know, tell you the time in about six different countries and uh, in all sorts of bells and whistles. Um, so what's happened? The world as a whole has got a much wider range of goods, a range of cheaper watches if you want, and a range of very expensive, better quality watches that do all sorts of other things, if that's what you want. Okay, and uh, again, it's specializing in things which you alone can supply. Only the Swiss can supply a couple of hundred years' worth of expertise in producing really good quality watches and watch parts. Uh, the Japanese produce mass, uh, low quality stuff. Okay, um, now another point I want to make is, as I mentioned, the time period over which all this has been developing, I said the Stone Age, but also we have in the 19th century, 19th century we have the development, real development of the world economy, and that is because the, US, the uh, Britain at that time followed a policy of unilateral free trade. All other countries, trading partners, restricted British imports, imports from Britain. Uh, even its own colonies restricted imports from Britain. New Zealand and the Australian colonies had restrictions on uh, British manufacturers coming in. And uh, we were supposed to be the British Empire. Uh, Whitehall could do nothing about it, of course, uh, because these were sovereign colonies. Contradiction in terms? No, it's, a, uh, it's exactly the uh, re reality. Okay, so as a result of that, what you had was therefore a large part of the underdeveloped world as well, which is part of the British Empire, following uh, the same policy of free trade, and in all of these areas, you had eventually the development of industries under both laissez-faire and free trade. The Indian cotton textile industry, in fact, is older than the Japanese. The first Indian cotton mill was opened in 1851 or 52. Uh, the first Japanese cotton mill was opened in 1860-something so that the Indian cotton textile industry is older than the Japanese, complete free trade, complete laissez-faire. And uh, it produced cotton yarn, and therefore you had expansion in the handloom industry in India. And to this day, uh, the best textiles in the world are mill-made yarn, hand-woven into uh, various sorts of textiles. Uh, the Indian textile industry also supplied cotton yarn to the handloom spinners in China. And so therefore the Chinese handloom industry expanded. And it was as a result of British shipping, lowest cost shipping that you could get, and therefore all this stuff, uh, intra-Asian trade also developed amongst the less developed areas. International specialization, in other words, is something uh, which is to be embraced because it reduces costs, increases variety. Okay, um, 20th century, of course, we had uh, problems, and that is mainly because of the increased role of government officials, and also because, uh, unfortunately, the increased in, uh, influence of the U.S., U.S. government, and uh, therefore, first of all, you raise trade barriers, and then you go around higgling about how you're going to reduce those trade barriers which you raised in the first place. Lots of work for bureaucrats, terrible for everyone else. Okay, um, the expansion of trade in specialization in the 20th century, in other words, has been despite the WTO, despite GATT, despite all these uh, acronyms that bureaucrats produce. 
Right, okay, and of course you have the growth of multinational enterprises also as a part of the growth of international trade generally. And the multinationals that survive are the ones which have been in, in existence actually since the late 19th century. Uh, and with the same specializations, the, Jap the Germans produce chemicals and so forth, uh, the Americans produce things like sewing machines. Uh, before 1914, the world's largest factory for producing sewing machines was the Singer Sewing Machine Factory in Glasgow, which uh, sold all over the, uh, the world. And if you look at what the American multinationals produce, it's things like uh, lifts, elevators, uh, cash registers, uh, and a whole range of similar things. And so what you get, in other words, is, again, specialization in producing those things for which you have what the economists call comparative advantage, your own skills, which the rest of the world doesn't have. Right, okay, how much time do we have? Two minutes, okay, can I stop there? Okay, any, um, ask for questions, I think. Hmm. Yes. Not once did you mention the word peace in globalization. And I'm a student uh, of Thomas J. Watson, I once worked for IBM in 1939, and he promoted the idea of world peace through world trade. Could you touch on that? Yeah, what is the role of peace in world trade? Yeah. Um, well, the more interdependent you are, the less likely you are to go to war. I mean, if you want to stop war, you want to stop the people who start war. It's only governments who benefit. If you ask me, wars are a giant conspiracy by all the governments involved against their respective populations. Yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> I mean, I can't get a jet plane to go and sort of bomb my neighbor, however much I might dislike him. <laughs> the most I can do is, you know, perhaps to shoot him. Uh, if I wanted to. Uh, it's only governments who have the resources to go to war, and it's only governments who benefit from war. Um, a number of very good uh, books are coming out now in Germany, pointing out that during the Second World War, the people who suffered were on the one hand the British and the other populations who were bombed by the Germans, and the Germans who in turn were being bombed by the British and the Americans and all the rest. So, they're beginning to ask the question, who benefited? Not the populations who were on, at, you know, at the receiving end of all these bombs. It was obviously the two governments involved, or the various governments involved. Um, so, uh, Mises book on state, this is the first book that was, uh, that he wrote, um, Nation, State and Economy, yeah. He points out there that the reason Germany lost the war was basically because it was so interdependent with the rest of the world, that it is impossible to cut itself off. And if you can't cut yourself off, how are you going to have a war? Uh, so the more interdependence, the more trade, the more peace. Very good. Thank you very much, Sudha. Yes.